This week on Milk Street, we head to Colombia for a cooking lesson, starting with fried empanadas. They're filled with beef, potatoes, and spices, and served with a green salsa. Then it's a braised chicken with coconut and plantain, and we finish up with Colombian potato soup with chicken, corn, and capers. Please stay tuned for the cooking of Colombia. I'm Mariana Velasquez. I'm a food stylist, and I've been based in New York for over 23 years. I grew up here in Bogota, where we are, and my passion for food really comes from home. And so every time I return to Colombia, I feel I find something new. We are in this neighborhood called La Perseverancia, the Perseverance, right next to the neighborhood of San Diego where the first beer company was found, and it was called Bavaria, which is still very much a cultural symbol. So when you read about empanadas, sometimes you find that they're the perfect combination of that Spanish heritage, the indigenous Colombian culture, with the corn at the center of the recipe, and then the Afro-Colombian influence with the addition of spices and different flavors. They're usually deep fried, and most of the times made of two types of corn, and then ground into a dough. And sometimes there's an addition of dried masa so that it comes together as a binder. And even though Colombian cuisine is so regional and so varied, because we are one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, you'll find empanada everywhere you go. And what really changes is the filling. You know, if you're here in Bogota in the mountains, most likely empanadas will have meat and potatoes. Or if you're in the oceans, empanadas can have crab and fish or smoked rabbit. There's, of course, cheese empanadas, which are to die for. In Colombia, people tend to really sit for food and drink. It's very unusual to see someone drinking coffee walking down the street, as you would in New York, for instance. But empanadas, they're one of the only foods in Colombia you actually eat standing up. So here we have arepas de huevo, also known as empanadas de huevo. One of the most important things about empanadas is ají. It's a combination of cilantro, green onion, red chili, lime, and vinegar. But you know, it changes from place to place, and people really take pride on the way they prepare it. <laughs> Me dediqué de lleno uh, con esta idea hace 15. Mamá tenía un restaurante aquí en Bogotá y se quedó sin un empleado y ese día le dije, venga, yo le ayudo. Y ese día nació ese gusto. No hay una receta estándar. Cada vez hago según cómo quiera hacerla ese día. Aquí tengo Chile habanero, chile serrano, chile jalapeño y chile morito. Viene gente, habla conmigo y me enseñan cosas y yo las aplico. Lo Colombia es especial para el aquí. Tenemos tantos. Este es el tradicional nuestro, mira. Esto es impaltable y es espectacular y es rico. Ah, es delicioso. Y es mi mundo, es mi mundo la cocina. Estoy más rápido que tu cámara. So. You have to clarify empanadas for me. Like in Argentina, it's just like flour, water, salt, very simple filling. This looks more elaborate. Every Latin American community, South American community has their own version of empanadas. These empanadas are from Colombia. 
and we got the original recipe from Mariana Velazquez. And she told us that there are two types of main empanada dough. One type of dough uses all corn flour, and this type of dough that we're going to make uses a combination of corn flour and all-purpose flour, and it makes it easier to handle. Okay. But before we make the dough, we'll make the filling, and we're making a beef filling, but of course you can have a cheese filling, you can have a vegetable filling or an egg filling. The first thing we do is mash a few potatoes because in Colombia, potatoes are king. So while I mash the potatoes, if you would get started on sauteing the onions for the meat filling. I'll give you a tablespoon and I will take a tablespoon for the potatoes and you'll get those sauteing in the melted butter and then we will put a lid on them for about eight minutes to let them brown. Now they'll brown without the lid of course, but the lid helps the onions soften as you know and they get a little sweeter. I was opposing to putting the lid on me, which is also one of <laughs> Do you Bianca's get sweeter? favorite. No, I just get kind of damp. And... <laughs> so these potatoes were previously boiled in salted water. We drain the water, we put the potatoes back in the pot. I just added that little bit of butter and now I'll just mash them and those onions sound good. The butter's melted, so I think they're ready for the lid. It takes about eight minutes, you'll stir occasionally and then they'll be a nice light golden brown. The onions are ready. <laughs> you can take the lid off now, we're done with that. Okay, if you'll stir in the tomato paste, we'll let that brown for about, you know, a minute at the most. Ready to put in fresh tomatoes, the requisite garlic, and some chopped jalapeno. So now we're ready for the beef. A little bit of cumin and some coriander, and some salt. I just like to say you're not fooling around. That was a good amount of cumin and coriander, actually. So just break it up because you don't want any big clumps of beef because this is going into a tiny empanada. We want it to be nice and evenly distributed. So all that's left is to let this cook down for about 15 minutes until the meat is fully done. Looks good, sounds good. And we will turn off the heat, fold in the mashed potatoes and some chopped cilantro for a fresh herbal note. See how thick that got now suddenly? Yeah, so that's yeah. gonna have some nice holding power. So once this cools down a little bit, we'll transfer it to a bowl and put it in the fridge. Now we're ready to make the dough. We have all-purpose flour in here. We'll add the corn flour to this and a little bit of salt, of course. All right, mix that on low. Now here comes the fat, which is the good part, right? The melted butter, still warm. And then we have a good bit of whole milk, Greek-style <laughs> yogurt. The acid helps tenderize the dough and it makes it very pliable. We'll mix it for about five minutes to help develop the gluten, which helps make the dough even more pliable. Okay, look at that, look how together it came. Now- I'm with you is fun, because you just get all excited. But you enjoy it too. I love it too. And now, you get to do the fun part. Okay. You can knead that. When you feel it's ready, you can divide it in half and then shape each half into a disc and they get wrapped separately. It just makes it easier to roll out later. Beautiful. So we'll wrap these in plastic wrap. We will chill them for an hour or up to a day ahead. And then when we will roll out the dough and make our little empanada. We took the dough out of the fridge for about 15 minutes just to let the chill come off of it. Not to get warm, but just so it's not ice cold. This is going to be fun. This is a completely different type of dough. We're gonna roll it out until it's a 16th of an inch thick. <laughs> okay. Okay, a 16th of an inch, like you said. That is kind of hard to tell, but you can tell. Bianca. If you need a ruler, you should get a ruler. <laughs> I have to say, this dough is just marvelous. It's soft, but it doesn't break and tear. Didn't I just make fun of you for being excited about dough? <laughs> and now look at me. Four inch cutter. If you don't have a cookie cutter four inches, use an upside down bowl or you know a large wide glass. You wanna get about 12 per half, so cut as close to the edge as you can and it's close together. Then with the scraps, you can mush those together and re-roll them if you need to. So. For Colombian empanadas, we are going to use our cold meat filling to fill these. So we'll put about four teaspoons of filling, which is just around a tablespoon. Spread it out a little bit, leaving the edges clear. And then this is important. You don't want to over moisten the edges or they'll slide apart instead of sticking together. Mm. So just a little bit on your finger and just around half of the dough, not the whole ring. And then bring the two sides up together and then press. And you want to get all the way down to the corners and then Turn it over, smash just a little bit to even out the filling. And instead of braiding or roping or twisting, the very simple decoration of the Colombian way is just the simple fork pressing. So you press with a fork, it seals it in, and it gives a little decorative edge as well. You can even do a little cross hatch if you like. Once these are filled, we'll let them chill in the fridge for 30 minutes while we heat the oil. 
We have about an inch and a half of a neutral oil in here. We want to bring it to 350. Let's talk about frying versus baking for a minute. Now in Argentina, they bake them. In yeah. Colombia, they fry them. Oh. Now, the difference between baking and frying has everything to do with the texture of the dough. You can bake these, you can put them in a 400 degree oven with a little egg wash on them and they will bake up beautifully. But when you fry them, that dough becomes bubbly and crisp and the contrast of that against the filling is fantastic. We will fry them six at a time so we don't overcrowd the pot. You don't want them to stick together and you don't want to cool the fat down too much. These have been in the fridge for half an hour, so they're nice and firm. Now this only takes three to four minutes. It's not much time at all. You want to let them get nice and golden brown on one side, flip them over, and then you'll scoop them out when they're ready. Now you wouldn't think that cold filling would heat up in this amount of time, but it does. It is piping hot in there. So mm. these need to cool down a little bit before you eat them. Come back up to 350. Next batch goes in. Now, one thing that Mariana insisted on was that we serve it with the ají, mm -hmm. which is a green salsa made with uh, jalapenos, a little okay. bell pepper, and cilantro. It has a little vinegar and lime juice on it, so it has a nice tangy freshness. Dig in. Mm. Mm. I just heard the crunch, but the fry texture is what, to me, makes it. So these are Colombian-style empanadas with a really great crust and a nice spiced meat filling. I should make these for old home day in our town of Vermont, you mm -hmm. know, where they do the fried dough and they do the french fries. Mm -hmm. Have the empanada booth. This will be a hit. This recipe is an adaptation of Mariana Velasquez's pollo guisado and coco y ají criollo. And while she explains in her book Colombiana it's not exactly a traditional recipe, it does in fact keep in the spirit and keeps a lot of the nuances of Colombian cuisine. We want to add subtle smoky notes into this chicken braise, and we accomplish that by charring a couple vegetables, shallots, as well as Cuban el peppers. So let me go ahead and show you how we prepare these. So first things first, you want to lop off that entire top stem and that exposes all of the seeds on the interior. But if you can't easily pull them out at this point, you could always cut them right in half lengthwise. And then from there, you could use the tip of your knife to cut out any of the membrane. I like to tap my cubanelles cut side down to remove any of the seeds that are lingering on the interior. And then with the cut side facing up, go ahead and slice all these peppers into half inch pieces and now we could go ahead and char these things. Right now I have the broiler set to high with a rack set about six inches below the heating element. And I'm going to transfer all of my peppers here onto a rimmed baking sheet. And of course, we're also throwing on our shallots. Now these shallots have been peeled and halved. So now I'm going to throw them under the broiler and they're going to char for about eight to 10 minutes or until everything has a nicely even dark brown coloration. While my peppers and shallots char, let's go ahead and cook our chicken. I have bone-in skin on chicken thighs here, and we're going to cook them in a large Dutch oven that's set over medium-high heat. But first, I have to add some oil. Here I have some coconut oil, but neutral oil will totally work. And we'll heat that oil up until it begins to shimmer. And now we're going to transfer our chicken right into the pan, skin side down. Now it's important to work in batches, so that way all the chicken has enough room to release its moisture and fully brown. Now, I only have half of my chicken in there, but we're going to leave it there for about eight to 10 minutes, so that way that skin browns up. Look at that, evenly brown, beautifully caramelized, and it's going to impart such a great smoky note into this really rich braise. Speaking of braising, my chicken is fully seared. It developed a really beautiful golden brown on that skin. You'll also note that I haven't cooked the chicken on the other side. That's because we're going to finish cooking it in the braise. Right now we're browning the skin to develop a lot of flavor in the pot and it'll also extract a little bit of the chicken fat to bolster the chicken richness. So now I'm going to take all that fat that's in the Dutch oven and actually remove it, all except for like two tablespoons, because that's going to help us cook the rest of the dish. I'm also going to remove all of this chicken skin so that way we braise only the chicken thighs. I only have two tablespoons of that fat left in the pan and all of the skin on my chicken thighs has been removed, so we're ready to keep on cooking. The next bit that we're going to saute is a bunch of cilantro stems that have been finely chopped, along with some jalapeno that's been seeded and chopped up into half inch pieces, and finally some garlic. Now there's a lot of residual heat happening on this pan, but we have it set over medium to keep things cooking. The other thing that we're going to be adding into this pan is all of our charred vegetables. Go ahead and scrape all of those right into the pot. So now we'll cook all of these vegetables for about five minutes or until they soften. The cubanelles and the shallots are already pretty soft, so look to the jalapenos to be your guide. 
already. So my veggies are nice and softened. So now it's time to hit it with some broth. This is our braising liquid, but it's also going to help us scrape up all of that umami rich goodness. You'll see the color of the broth change pretty drastically to a dark brown. That's flavor, baby. So now we'll bring this entire mixture up to a boil. And with everything bubbling away, I'm now going to nestle my chicken in a nice even layer into this braising liquid. So with all the chicken in the pan, we're going to reduce the heat down to medium low and pop a lid on it. This chicken is going to braise for about 35 to 40 minutes. So now we're going to add in some plantains into our braise here. So to prep your plantain, you're going to lop off both ends. Now you could slip off that peel. You could then cut this plantain right in half and then slice that in half lengthwise and just cut them in half lengthwise again. After cutting them in half, you'll wanna cut them into half inch pieces. So as you can see, a little wedge just like that is exactly what we're looking for. So from here, we could throw this into our braise along with some full fat coconut milk. So give this a stir and you'll want to adjust the heat to maintain a low simmer. It should only take about 10 minutes. The plantains are nice and tender and since we cooked that without the lid, it's thickened just a little bit. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove it from heat altogether and I'm going to introduce a little bit more freshness, some levity. So I'm throwing in some freshly squeezed lime juice as well as half of my cilantro here because I wanna save the rest for garnish. Give that a little stir. So let me go ahead and scoop myself a little bit of rice and now let's get some of this good stuff in here. The chicken is practically falling off the bone here. Signs of a good braise. Now we'll top that off with a little extra cilantro. Mm. The flavor of coconut and plantain just transports me right to Colombia. Mariana Velasquez got it right. This is such a comforting dish and I have a feeling you're gonna fall right in love with it. This is our braised chicken with coconut and plantains. So here we are, about 10 kilometers from the closest town. Yeah. We're high up in the Andes. And this is my dear friend, Ricardo Maña, so who's having us over in his beautiful home. Ajiaco is a soup based on potatoes. You know, potatoes are so important because it's, it's one of the species that changed the world when the Spaniards came here and took it to Europe. In Colombia, we have like 750 different kinds of potatoes. But for ajiaco, we only use three, thanks God. Uh, <laughs> one that is called the pastusa is a potato that dissolves. And the object for this potato is to give a thickness to the soup. Then you have the samanera. This is the potato that is used for French fries, for instance. It's harder and it doesn't dissolve. And this one is called the criolla. It's a very small, very colorful potato that tastes very, very different. When we're here, we're sharing the chicken that it's already been cooked and there's no too, too fine so that it doesn't get dry and continues to have some consistency. And then on top of that, you put some avocado. And this is a native variety of avocado, papelillo, no? Yes. Different from the Haas, it has a creamier texture and it's lighter in color as well. You can see, and it's very easy to peel and some herbs. And, and don't forget the corn. So the corn has and been a corn. whole debate. Why? No, they don't like it? Well, no, I mean, there's been debate about having the grains of corn in the soup, but... No, 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 no. <laughs> no you, you pinch the, the corn by both sides and you eat it by hand like this. So the way you do it is that you serve the soup with potatoes. You put the corn as this, and then chicken, you, the chicken here. Okay. You put some capers. Como una alcaparra grande. Mm -hmm. You put cream, then you put aguacate. I'm gonna do my aguacate on the side. You know, mm -hmm. like hot avocado is terrible. Yes. So I add it to the soup, mm -hmm. bite, bite, bite. Mariana, cheers. Cheers. For the honor of having you here. So you can really smell the guascas, which are delicious. And then the soup is quite light, but creamy at the same time. It's good, you know, the capers give it enough saltiness and the potatoes have all these dimension and different taste. It's quite comforting, no? This flavor really reminds me of home, you know? Yes. I mean, of growing up, of Bogota. In general, it feels like, like I'm home. Yeah. yeah.
Columbia boasts 750 varieties of potatoes. 750. So it should come as no surprise that when we visited Bogota, we tried a soup called ajiaco, which is a potato and chicken soup. And in this soup, the potato is really the star of the show. It sounds really complex, but it's actually really simple to make. So we're gonna start by making the base of the soup, which is sort of like a chicken broth. And we're gonna use bone in what once was skin on chicken breast, but we took the skins off because we don't want the soup to get greasy. So we can put these in the pot whole, and then we'll add some aromatics. We have some scallions, those go in whole, some celery, and then some whole cilantro, leaves and stems. And then for the potatoes, we're gonna use three different varieties of potatoes, but we had to find some potatoes that were comparable to the ones that they have in Colombia. So the first potato they use in Colombia is called pastusa. It's really starchy yellow potato. In place of that one, we're gonna use a russet, also very starchy. The next one that they use in Colombia is called criolla. It's a tiny little potato, really, really buttery. In place of that one, we're gonna use a Yukon gold potato. And both of these get sliced into about quarter inch thick slices. So those can go into the pot. Now these potatoes that are going at the beginning are really gonna kind of break down and that's gonna make almost like a creamy texture to the soup. Now the next thing that's kind of a critical element in the soup is corn. So the recipe calls for four cobs of corn. Two of those get plopped right into the middle of your bowl. The other two, we're going to cut the kernels off the cob and then put the cobs in. The cob still has a ton of really great corn flavor, so that's gonna do a wonderful job of seasoning our soup. So we're gonna put in some garlic and some salt and pepper and then some water. All right, I'm gonna keep these kernels of corn. We're gonna add them at the very end. In the meantime, this is gonna come up to a simmer. We'll reduce the heat to medium and let that go for about 30 minutes, just until those chicken breasts are reaching 160 at the thickest part of the breast. All right, the chicken is cooked through, so we can take that out now. We're gonna just set that aside until it's cool enough to touch, and then eventually we're gonna shred it. In the meantime, I'm gonna take out all those aromatics we put in earlier. And you can see that these potatoes that are in here are already starting to break down. So I mentioned three different types of potatoes. We've only seen two so far. So the last one would replace a Colombian potato called a sabanera. It's a dense, waxy potato, kind of purplish in color. Instead, we're gonna use a red bliss potato or any sort of small, waxy, dense potato. And we're putting these in a little bit later, so they're gonna hold their shape. So we've got this really nice contrast of the potatoes that have broken down, and then we have these potatoes that are gonna keep their shape. So we're gonna have a really nice contrast of textures. And then we can add in the corn that's on the cob. So two cobs of corn cut into three pieces. So I'm just gonna let that come back up to a simmer and let that go for about five minutes until the corn that's on the cob is cooked through. So it's been five minutes, the corn is cooked. I'm gonna take it out at this point and we'll set those aside. You'll get that on the table and you'll be able to put one in your bowl if you'd like. In the meantime, this is gonna to continue to cook for probably another 20 to 25 minutes. In the meantime, I'm gonna shred up our chicken. All right, these potatoes have broken down. Their starchiness really helps kind of thicken the soup. So the last couple of things we're gonna put in are those corn kernels that we cut off the cob earlier and then a traditional Colombian herb, really an important one in this recipe, it's called guascas. It's a mountainous herb. I sort of feel like it tastes kind of like a combination between bay leaf and parsley. It's dried, it's really easy to order online, but if you can't find it, our friend Mariana Velasquez, who's a Colombian food expert, says you can use chopped up celery leaves. All right, that's gonna just take about five minutes for that corn to cook through. All right, now we can finally start our soup bar. Some chicken, plop in some corn. Do not sleep on the capers. They're so good in this, I can't stress that enough. And then a little bit of cream. I'm gonna put my avocado on the top where it's protected from any heat. All right, this looks fantastic. It smells so good. It's very aromatic. So you can smell that guascas and the corn in this. It's so, so delicious. 
right? Those corn kernels at the end are still kind of crisp, which is really, really nice. And you have these creamy potatoes in here. It has so much flavor. It's so complex, but it's really quite simple and rustic. This is Ahiako Colombian potato soup with chicken, corn, and capers. It's on every table in Bogota, Colombia, and we think it should be on yours too. You can get this recipe and all of the recipes from this season of Milk Street at MilkStreetTV.com. Recipes and episodes from this season of Milk Street are available at MilkStreetTV.com, along with shopping lists, printer-ready recipes, and step-by-step -step videos. Access our content anytime to change the way you cook. The new Milk Street cookbook is now available and includes every recipe from our TV show. From pad thai with shrimp and no-fry eggplant parmesan to Korean fried chicken and salty honey brown butter bars, the Milk Street cookbook offers bolder, fresher, easier recipes. Order your copy of the Milk Street cookbook for $27, 40% less than the cover price. Call 855-MILK-177 or order online.